Well, welcome. Uh, you have been traveling around the world. You've been, you know, on uh, in many different time zones, finishing out this season uh, in absolutely uh, victorious fashion. I think it's fair to say. But at least according to what I read in the papers, you're done as a as a speed as a world class or World Cup speed skater. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. All right. But it did quote, it did say that you didn't leave completely out the possibility that you might return for some World Cup race, but only for fun, I think is paraphrasing. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know, I'm an athlete. I'm always going to be an athlete. I'm going to keep training. And if I think if my level just happened to be strong enough next year to perform a decent 10K, then I think I don't see why I wouldn't go for that. Uh, but that's not going to be on like a competitive international stage. But I think if I can do a 10K of 13 minutes or 13.10, then, you know, I'm still a World Cup speed skater level. And then I think I go see my friends and have a good time with them and, and do the race. But nothing more serious than that. Okay. But I, I got to ask, I got to ask you, because I mean, everything about you in this project of two years has been to peak and to be the very best. And then you say that you could, you could do that. You could show up and knowing you're not at your very best. Can you do that? Could you do that? Say, say that again. I could show up and know. Could you show up at a world cup race? Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah and say, you know, I'm 30, 40 seconds slower than I have been at my best, but I'm good with that. I'm okay. Cause I, I just want to participate. Are you able to do that? Yeah. So I think the general idea about me as an athlete is that I always win because that, that has been the case in the international speed skating arena last year. Um, but Johan knows very well how much I've lost. We did, we did this training session last year, for example. We were running 15 minutes, 15 minutes intervals. Um, and and I, I was running a lot at the time. I'm not a very talented runner. And no one had been talking that he wanted to join me for a running session. And um, I got pretty good watch numbers, but I'm not a fast runner at all. So I was doing those, uh, those intervals at like 350 per kilometer or something like that. And Johan is a little nervous. Because, you know, I, I'm, I'm a pro athlete and training hard and stuff like that. So he's like, oh, I really want to be able to catch up with you today, Nils. And, uh, you know, we do the first set. And uh, Yuan is just running next to me. And, you know, it's all good. And towards, towards the end of the first set, I, there's this slow uphill slope. Uh, we keep it together. And maybe Yuan is like a feet in front of me or something. But it's all right. Second set starts. And, like... Three minutes into the second set, this is like, like threshold for me, like stress threshold, something like that. Right. Two minutes into the second set, Yuan goes like, hey, Nils, did you talk to David lately? How's he doing? <laughs> <laughs> so is he, is he try, he's trying to psych you out by talking. I got, I got it. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, trying or not, he succeeded. Then we were running through those, like, <laughs> uh, what do you call that? Like, um, Keepers of cows. Yeah, fen fences, and then there's like a where you can go through a fence where they have cows. Yeah. You also, you so you like open gate. A, a gate. And you want just yeah. starts running through the gates, like, oh, there's the gates. I'll guide it, get it for you. And he just runs in front of me over the gate. I just get to pass like some, you know. Back See, this this is good because yeah. this brings in the the second aspect of this, which is Johan. And and for those, eventually the people who watch this, they're not all speed skaters, or at least I hope not there i hope because i think there's a lot to offer from from your uh writing about training in general but johan you you're not just anybody that happened to be running in front and pushing the gates open uh you've been a, a world-class speed skater yourself a junior world all-around champion i believe is correct as as were you Niels, junior all-around champion Never in the 5K, never on the all-around. Not in the all-around, in the, in the 5K. Okay. Yeah. So, so at, both of you were world champion at the junior level, and then you were in three Olympics, Johan, uh, as I recall, from Salt Lake City to 
to Vancouver. Is that right? Yeah. Right. Um, and and now you've been uh, coach of Neil's for is it both the last two years? Uh, the last uh, three years, I would say. Three years. Like we we, we uh, started uh, the, the the conversation about about this uh, collaboration started, I guess, during the last Olympic season already. Uh, and then uh, Nils had the first uh, year. Um, uh, he did the um, uh, military service for one year uh, after right. the last Olympics in in uh, Korea. So. All right. Well, I think at least usually people, I'm usually on the other side of the mic and people are asking me questions and they usually ask, okay, tell us something about your childhood and all that. So I'm going to do the same to you. Uh, you know, because, all right, you're, you're from Sweden. You're both Swedish. Your, your Vanderpool last name is harks of, of, of your heritage uh, related to the Dutch, but you are Swedish. You grew up in what is it? Trollhatten? A yeah, fa fairly small city, I guess it would be. Um, why speed skating? So in Sweden, this uh, ice sport is pretty, cool. it's pretty big, it's called bandy. It's like uh, ice hockey, but uh, the rink is a little bigger, targets a little bigger, and there's a ball instead of a puck. Hmm. Uh, I was doing that, and, and growing up, I was really into sports. Like that was that was my life, and. Uh, I really wanted to become a good international sportsman, and I thought Bandy was uh, was the game for me. Uh, and then there was this uh, speed skating club from Trondheim. It was a very small club, like all the other speed skating clubs in Sweden are very small. Mm. Um, and they had their training session right after the Bandy session. And my father is a very talkative guy, so he uh, started talking to the speed skating coach. Uh, and uh, the coach found out that I had a Dutch last name. And then he said, well, then your kids should be doing speed skating in a pundit. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my father asked me afterwards, like, do you want to try this speed skating thing? And I never heard of it uh, at the time. I think yeah. most people really had no idea what sport was. And I was one of them. Uh, so, um, but to me, I, it was just like, I, I get to be on the, uh, on the rink a little bit longer. Like, yeah, that's, I like that. That sounds good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, so yeah, I started and uh, the idea was first to like learn how to skate better so I could become a better bandy player. And uh, I was pretty young at this time. I was like eight years old, but I was really determined to be a good sportsman. Um, yeah, and a few years down the road, I just realized that my potential is probably greater within the speed skating world than in the bandy world. So I turned my attention in that direction, basically due to my possibility of going pro, I'd say. Yeah, and it's interesting. And you write in the, <laughs> I have to say, it, I keep, I'm going to use the word manifesto. I think that's a, a bad word to use because it, it harkens. <laughs> it harken, <laughs> yeah, it makes it, it sounds like you've gone unhinged and, you know, and it's 500 pages of, of drivel, but... <laughs> <laughs> but it is the opposite of that in the, the what you wrote there was i found it to be extremely clear and to the point and also you didn't try to say this is something everybody should adopt you were very careful to say this is this is what i did and it may or it may not help you but you you were open and so it, it's the opposite of a manifesto but that word has been used a lot so i just want to say that up front but Whatever you want to call it, your, oh, you know, just just uh, full disclosure of your training. Um, in that, you talk about that transition or the period as a junior where your identity was very much connected to sport and to being successful in sports. Um, did that? And it sound it kind of you kind of express it as a bit of a negative or a, a challenge that you had to overcome and and that was part of reshaping the way you trained in these last two three years um you know the five two and everything can you say a little bit about just that and you know i you, you you're successful as a junior then you the two, 2018 olympics i mean you're in the olympics which in itself is a, a, a great achievement but 
your 14th and then you don't get to do the 10k because you don't you have to be in the top 12 so were you disappointed were you what was your feeling coming out of 2018 yeah i was very disappointed so i think one of the first deeper talks me and you one had was the night i did not qualify for the 10k at the olympics that was a big crusher for me and um Uh, so the whole identity thing was, it was growing up a lot until I won the first junior worlds, I think. Uh, and that was like four years earlier or something like that, 2014. And up until that point, I was just very, very, very dedicated that I I'm going to be the best piece here in the world. And that's worth whatever cost it may be. And uh, it ain't. Uh, that was the lesson of it. it. It really ain't. So when I won my first Junior Worlds, it was uh, it was the best feeling of my life for 10 seconds and then for the rest of the day also. But it was also this uh, growing feeling that, holy shit, this was not worth it. I should mm. really not have done this. It's, it's the most awesome thing I've ever done, but it was still not worth the sacrifice. Mm. Because to me, it was a sacrifice of a lot of friendships and... Uh, uh, the feeling of getting to be a teenager and uh, school and uh, you know other possibilities in life mm. and now I, I grew very bitter that i gave all that up for for being a good speed skater um, mm. and i think that really the shift starting to happen a little bit earlier i think uh, but that was really like the, the point of no return for me i realized that I cannot keep on doing what I've been doing because this is not good for me. Um, and then there, there's, there is really this picture of what a good sportsman should be like. He should make certain choices in life. He should perhaps eat in a proper manner or whatever. He should perhaps not drink. He should perhaps go to bed at a certain time. He should perhaps not hang out with this kind of people or whatever it may be. And some of those things are rooted in something that's um, you know, something approximating a clever idea. But some of them we just do to to seem like we are trying hard. Because growing up in sports, you get so many people to help you along the way based upon your engagement to the challenge and their interest in wanting to help a good guy. So you want to seem like a good guy and make the right choice that a good guy makes and fit into this role. And perhaps more than half of all those sacrifices are not really making you a better speed skater. They're just giving you the image of trying to be a good speed skater. And I just did not like that way of uh, living my life. It, uh, it stole so much motivation to, uh, to, to repress all the things I wanted to do. Right. Well, Johan, you're the coach and your, your athlete is going through a crisis of identity uh it sounds like how did you deal with this what well was your uh, role? Uh, well at this time i was not a uh, coach for nils at this time um he had uh, matthias Sabes. yeah, at this time. yeah was, yes. um, okay. but i was uh i was actually a little bit involved because i was uh when was this 2014 15 14 15 yeah and i had stopped my career 20, uh, 2010 but i uh, when I stopped after Vancouver racing, I, I decided that because I I, I I love to do sports and compete and uh, uh, I still love speed skating when I quit, but I don't love the uh, all the traveling and stuff associated with trying to do it on the top level because you can't really do it in Sweden. Uh, we have no arenas uh, for that. Mm -hmm. um, so um, so I, I, I continue to race. Uh, Every year I race Swedish championships and stuff, uh, all the way until 2019, I think. Uh, oh, yeah. But so, so then I had seen and Nils already, already then I had he, he had been on some of the races and and oh, of course in the community you knew that oh, there was this young guy from Trollhättan who who had the talent to become a good uh, long distance skater, uh, and and I had uh, yeah I don't know if we talked but. I had seen you around, and I knew I knew his coach. Uh, uh, and then uh, when this 
yeah, when he decided to, to quit after the second, uh, after the, the second uh, Junior World uh, Cold, wasn't it? Yeah. Sure. Um, then uh, uh, I, we had some contact uh, after that because uh, I also had similar experiences uh, from being a junior. Um, when I, I tried to explain it, the same thing that Nils explained, when I tried to, to say it, I, I, I talk about it. Like you have, uh, I think many, many sportsmen have this, that they, like they have a junior coach and you do everything the coach says and you get really good. Uh, and, but sometimes you're also grow like you are also growing up. And this is one thing that I learned when I was, because I was junior world champion uh, 2000 and 2001. And then a couple of years later, I came, uh, I was in a, a Dutch professional speed skating team with some of the best, uh, the DSB team with yeah. um, really good, uh, Jan Boss and Ids Postman, really good uh, speed skaters. And then I was, some years in Norway also training with, mm. with, with some of the best uh, guys in the world. And then, so that was kind of my, my school in learning that to become, to be one of the best or to, to win a world championship. And I said it several times to Nils also during this period. It's, it, it's not about the guy who, who doesn't eat dessert every, it's, it's not that guy who wins doesn't have to do with that like, like it's it's not that you go to bed every day at 10 o'clock you don't eat dessert you don't drink alcohol it's not about that because i know guys they drink sometimes they have fun they do other stuff they can still be world champion champions and it's not necessarily about also doing uh i'm, I'm not going to say names here but <laughs> it's like you can uh it I have always been interested in, in like the training process and also peaking a lot. I've been interested in that during my own career and, and read everything I, I can about it. And uh, an important, one really important aspect that has a little bit to do with this is also, it, it has so much to do, peaking has so much to do with the workload you can do during the last, yeah, the period can vary a little bit, but is it the last six months or the four months right, or something? Right. It has so much to do with that and much less to do with how much, uh, that, that, that what you did the last five years or something means something also, but what you build up to that you can do the last four months or six months or mm. That means so much more what you do in that period, and then it's not then it's not so then it it's not so important with all this. Uh, uh, like it's in, in, diff, in different training uh, environments in speed skating, it's people are doing so many different things uh, all around the year. But I, I saw in these groups that I were in that when when uh, guys because it was mostly guys that I uh, was training with. Uh, when they got it, when they got the pieces together in September, and then they did it really good from September, then they could be good in February. And if they had the base from before, then it, if they didn't do it super good, yeah, from uh, June until September, didn't matter so much. It was about getting that block really good. Right. Uh, okay. Well, yeah, that, that was uh, a little bit. Uh, yeah. No, that's okay. About my opinions <laughs> about this, but what? Anyway, I was involved with Nils uh, a little bit, and I said that, you know, I had the same experience as a junior, and it's not about that. It's about you have to you have to also have a life. I like you can be a world champion and you can have kids and you can do other stuff in life, but you have to get that. In the end, the last block, you have to get that the training done. You have right. to get that. You have to do the work. You have, yeah. to do the, you have to do the work, but you can also do other stuff. Right. You can't do it if, 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 it's, if it stops you from doing the work, of course. You have to do the work. But if you do the work, you can do other stuff. I think that's really hard as a junior or a youth skater to realize, okay, I do like all these 10 different things to become a better athlete. Which is the main ones? Which can I not right. waste energy on? And which should I really, really invest in? Right. And I think common is 
the, the, the younger you are, the less influence you have over the training program. I was very fortunate. I had Matthias, who coached me before, was very, uh, he was truly aiming for, for me to take part in the uh, training planning and training um, process. So, right. Which spoke me a lot, and I really like that. Uh, however, I was still not able to see which pieces were the main pieces as I can see that today. And I think that makes it really hard because if you cannot affect the training program so much when you're 16, but you still know that m my main goal in life is to win the world championships or the Olympics or whatever. But I don't quite understand how to affect the training program in a proper manner. Well, then there's just other things in life that I, I, know, I know or heard of will affect my performance. Mm. Let's just invest all I can in affecting those in the best possible manner. So you just you just start pushing away everything else and, and trying to, to do every single thing uh, exactly. right because you're not sure which one matters the most so you do everything and that really switched that really switched leading up to the 2018 olympics then i really went to like the pendulum swung the other way and i was very very laid off and i only did like what i had to do in training i didn't do any extra work and i, I was skydiving a lot i was drinking a lot and in, you know, in the lead up, in in the lead up to 2018 yeah exactly so between the, okay years in 2015 i had this half a year of a break and then i decided to come back and uh and i, st I still worked with matthias Hadish at the time and uh yeah the pendulum really swung the other way so i was really this over serious dude to begin with i became this uh, very laid off dude and performed 14th at the olympics yeah and then i think i kind of find the middle way leading up to 2022 right like, yeah. i knew both sides had their advantages right. We both sides had their, you know, traps. Uh, and um, yeah, we really molded them together in a proper way. Yeah. So and you finished 2018 and then you went into the military for a year. Yeah. So okay. you, yeah. you took another hiatus from skating, uh, yeah. which led, was it just one year, 12 months, something like that? Yeah, it was maybe 14 months, which 14 11 months. months in the army. Yeah. And you, you know, you weren't lazy. You were physically active, like you described yourself. You could do, you know, you could do reps with two twenty-five kilos, and you had a forty-minute ten k. So you hadn't, you know, you hadn't quit. You didn't get fat, but you were not skating at all. And then you decide, you know, and now I got to ask, you know, because you you decide, all right, I've got, I've got, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do a project, and you now you've got in your head some, and and I guess now Johan, you're in the picture, and you're discussing the the plan, the project. Uh, already then in 2019, are you thinking, hey, I can be the best? Yeah, I was thinking that when I was eight years old, I think. Yeah, but are you there again mentally in 2019? When you quit, when you came out of the military service, you're about to start the, the aerobic season and start doing all the volume. Are you already saying, hey, this is going to take me all the way to the top? Yeah, yeah I was. Okay. <clears throat> I was really, I felt like I had seen a way to, to do the sports that no one else had noticed. <laughs> okay. uh, and I felt like it was just, yeah, it was just standing in front of me. Like, why hasn't anyone else done it this way? This seems to be a lot better. <laughs> so I just, it, it wasn't, and this is the very interesting thing here, because I wasn't very, I wasn't highly motivated at the time. Like, after the 20, 2018 Olympics, I was, I was 14 on the 5K. On the 10K, I, today I still think I could have medaled. I could have been, I was easily top five. Okay. Um, today I could have medaled. Um, but I was not the best, for sure not. However, after the 20, 2018, I knew that I wasn't really satisfied with my speed skating career, that I would always think back, like, what if, you know, what if I would have or, um, And so it was actually, actually then I wrote this main idea of how to do it to be the best speed skater in 2022. I just wasn't willing to do it because I was not motivated enough. So I did the year in the army and I realized that, well, whichever path I choose to go down, life is going to suck a lot. And the army path sucked and the speed skating path, they also sucked. Um, 
so if I can just align myself in a manner and try to work with that and, you know, be kind to myself and, you know, maybe treat myself more properly and, and negotiate with myself instead of forcing myself to do stuff that I don't want to do, then maybe I can find a way to do that work. And those, that idea kind of flourished a bit more in 2019. And I realized that, okay, there's, there is a way to do this that I'm actually willing to do. Uh, but it was like a lot of negotiating to get to that point and a lot of uh, imagination of how to make training fun. And, and Yuan came in there in a way and, and really opened up my eyes for the adventure running and adventure cycling kind of business. And, right. uh, um, and also at that point, we, I explained how I wanted to do it in like a broad manner to Yuan. And I explained this, I want to do this very, very long aerobic block to begin with. I want to skip the first competition season and, and just work aerobically for it's about 13, 14 months, 15 yeah. months, something like that. Yeah. That's what it looked like to me, 15 months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think when I started it, Yuan was perhaps even more convinced of its greatness than I was. Uh, I was just more like, okay, I'm going to play my cards in one way. And today I have zero Olympic medals. And if I have that in four years' time, well, like, life is not so bad today so i mean right if it doesn't yeah. then it work you know so i was like yeah let's, let's see how this goes and uh it turned out pretty well um, yeah all right so let's get into the week you know in this uh this op uh, <laughs> this not manifesto we'll call it the the not manifesto <laughs> the, the you you lay out some very some very specific aspects, and the first aspect is, I guess, I would say a a, a simplification of training. And I, I should back up and say I I am have this weird deal because I, I have never had a pair of clap skates on my feet, uh, but I spent several years with Jan Bos and Bob de Jong and Greta Schmidt and Stefan Grautaus and uh, Ingrid Paul and and and. I, I worked with the Dutch team and, and, and so I did kind of get inside speed skating for a few years leading up to Torino 2006 and Bob de Jong won the gold in the, in the 10,000. Uh, and, and I had quite a, some good conversations, a lot of time with him. So, so I have some relationship to speed skating and speed skating. They do a lot of different stuff. You know, they, they, they do, uh, you know, they got the slide board going and they've got the imitation exercises and the, and the rubber bands and running sideways on a treadmill and doing lots of string training and, and cycling and, and inline skating and, and speed skating. And, you know, so it is, it's just, man, there is a bunch of puzzle pieces and, and you know, that was, it was, it was fun, but we were constantly discussing the relative value of these different um, these different simulations and, and, uh, and, in and, and for example, uh, in that time, Joachim Altahaga came onto the team, uh, and he had won, he, you know, had been sensational in 2002 and now it's 2004, I guess, something like that, four or five. And he comes on and he'd had a bad period. And, and I remember asking him, I said, well, can you show me your training diaries? And he's like, I don't have any. Uh, well, what, what, you know, what were your key sessions? Well, I don't know. You know, he, he had, he was kind of the opposite of you. He was kind of passive and he had, he had come in into a good groove, but he really couldn't define what he had been doing. Uh, he didn't, he couldn't rediscover what he had been doing, but he could not do inline skating or the, you know, the, the out, the skating outdoors. He could not do a hard session in that mode, he, he just couldn't get his heart rate up. Even though he had been one of the best speed skaters in the world, he couldn't do the, the slightly different type of skating well enough to be able to use it as an interval session, which I found just fascinating. But it speaks to something that you spoke to in your document, which is that you know, I'm going to get rid of all the things that are close, but they end up not being close enough. They're not speed skating. They're not speed skating at 30 second speed with that specific technique. And so you really just pull, 
you know, you said you purified your training. You just got rid of a lot of stuff, uh, which I found quite fascinating, but it takes a lot of guts, I guess, to, to, to leave behind so much tradition in this. To me, it was just all of my life, all my life as a skater, I've done some sessions where I never showed up motivated. And that was, you know, doing inline skating in this uh, car park uh, where there's, you know, there's still some, there's dirt on the track and there's like, I can't really push hard on the inline because I'm not really a good inliner. So I can't really get it properly. And uh, hill sprints was also one of those sessions. Like I can't measure a hill sprint because it's like, I don't know if I'm good enough because we just didn't do it continuously enough. Right. Uh, because the hill was so far away. So we only drew there a few times a year. And like, I, I came to think that those sessions that I wasn't motivated enough to do, maybe that was because I didn't consider them to be effective enough. Right. So let's just drop it. And I was really coming down to, okay, my problem is that I'm not fast enough when I'm full of lactic. What will make me faster when I'm full of lactic? And the one value I can't, kind of came down to, and I think this was a lot of, together with you, Yuan, also, was that the threshold value is the key value. So if you can, in the beginning of the season, have a good threshold value on the bike, which is a very similar motion to speed skating, then perhaps that will be enough to have a good you know, starter point mm-hmm. for the specific speed skating season. So let's not do anything that does not improve my threshold on the bike that's a waste of time and that's a waste of energy. And that's really what we did. We only focus on getting the bike threshold up as much as possible. And uh, yeah, I became a good cyclist. Um, and that might not be the entire truth because the other part of the truth is we also want to build, build up a good aerobic capacity. Because as you say, the problem with speed skating and the reason why speed skaters train all this different stuff is because it's, it's, it's a lot of wear on the body to speed skate mm. because you cannot really do it slow. It, it's pretty much impossible to do it slow. Mm. And as I mentioned, it's to skate a lap of 30.0, it's not the same as skating a lap of 29.0 or 31.0. The technique, it, it's, it's different. Mm. And if you want to go aerobically on the ice, perhaps you have to skate, I don't know, a lap of 45 maybe. And that's just, that's just a different sport. Um, and that's why skaters do it. They're like we do the gym and we do the uh, imitation intervals and the slide board and the inline. And so we're just compensating because we are not able to speed skate. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to be able to speed skate. And then we really had to increase the aerobic capacity a lot. So that was the second aim of the preseason. So it was a year and a half of getting aerobically fit and getting the threshold value up on the bike. And then and, we didn't really do the speed skating culture because the speed skating culture is not a culture of getting your bike threshold up it's a culture of skating obviously yeah and when i came into that culture from rowing from running from cross-country skiing i was also a little bit like well wait this is strange because they were doing everything was so interval based very short intervals two or three laps and then they were standing up and then the zamboni comes out and so it was everything was kind of broken up into these small bites and so i said hey i want to do three times 20 minutes and they looked at me like I was insane that, that I was, that you want us to be in the skating position doing reasonably fast laps for 20 minutes continuously. Well, yeah, that's what we, they do in cycling and rowing and cross country skiing and running. And you guys, what, you're not tough enough, you know? <laughs> so, so anyway, and it, they did, but it took a while. But but the, the first time they did it, the only guy that could sit in a, a reasonably good ski, a skating position on that team that I was working with was Bob Dion. He, he could get down and, and still be under two millimolar lactate. But yeah. all the other guys were above three, just getting down into a good position and doing any kind of speed. So so it was, they, you know, that's how – Did the others what? ever get down? They the did. They got better. Okay. They, I, I truly believe, it, you know, I, I could use examples, but 
you know, Jan Bols and some of those guys. Jan had been an all-arounder as a junior, but he had yeah. issues with his tibia. Yeah, but he, but those guys, yeah, they, but they were afraid of losing their speed, though. Yeah. Uh, Jan said, "I don't want to lose my start," and I said, "You won't, because we're going to do specific sessions for that. But we're going to build up your back end. We're going to build up the aerobic side because it's easier for you to gain a second at the end of a race than it is at the start of a race." because of the aerodynamics. But anyway, so I, I think I do understand that culture that you were in, you know, and, and you were really so, but you took it way farther than I pushed when I came into it. You, cause, and you just pulled yourself out and, and did months and months and months of aerobic work without the specific skating training. Um, and that has to be, you know, another, huge departure from normal uh the thought process on specificity is you were not getting that specific neuromuscular stimuli for months because you just weren't on the ice um what what gave you the confidence that those patterns that that technical aspect would be there or would stay with you so uh, after my junior uh, second junior title i um I took six months of training, and uh, I also actually did a very short period in the army during that time. However, as I got back again, um, it was I lay. Uh oh, we lost it. November. November was the other way, um, and then uh, I had a demand on me from the Olympic Committee to perform a result to show them that you know I can still speed skate, so I can get the support I needed. So in February, I think I went to this uh, arena in uh, Germany and I did a test race uh, just to, like, to show them. And uh, I hadn't been skating for like a year almost. Like I'd done some sessions leading up to that just to, you know, to get fit again. And at that point, I was really nervous about can I still skate? I haven't done this for you know, some, some time. And uh, I, it was really no problem. It was just, uh, okay. you know, I had laces. I go out there and speed skating is a weird it's, it's a weird position and it's a weird feeling to do it. And it, to be really good at it, it's really based on being current. But at that point, it was just like, it feels like it has always felt and it, it looks like it's, it's always been looking. So no, the second time around when I did it in 2019 and started skating again in seriously, the autumn of 2020, uh, no, I wasn't nervous at all. I, I, oh, I, I okay. Did it once before. So. You, yeah, you had tested the concept, and you knew the 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 motor skills were going to be there for you, and so then you yeah, could con concentrate on on just building mitochondria, just building the uh, a system that could could handle the loads day in and day out. So 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 the first chapter in the in the not manifesto says all right we're going to just cook things down to two basic components first we're going to build the aerobic system and then we're going to get really good at very specific competition speed um and so you build up this three-part season well with a fourth little part but big big period of aerobic work big hours 30 plus hours a week run ski cycle six seven hours events sometimes sometimes uh ultra runs you beat yourself up pretty good at times <laughs> it looks like <laughs> yeah, um, I saw him do and, it. <laughs> yeah and 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 you said that's the only time you ever cried i believe was was after a hundred run 100 mile like, run pretty much typed yeah 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 <laughs> But but now here we bring in another element that has kind of rocked the endurance world uh, to the extent they're rocked by the manifesto here. Uh, that is the five two, this rhythm that you decided on the training rhythm, which says I'm going to go five days, big loads, big volume, but then I'm going to always take two days in a row free, no training other than just if the if the friends are out for a hike i'll go with them and that i mean i cannot express to you how few athletes i've ever talked to that would even be able to fathom the possibility of doing that 
you know, <laughs> so, I mean, getting my own daughter to take a day off, I can recall was just, you know, if she did that every three weeks, that was a, a breakthrough, you know, so, um, so this was a huge leap of faith, I would think. Uh, what was the discussion with you, between you guys on this? There was no discussion in the beginning. <laughs> Nils, uh, Nils decided uh, he did it uh, when he started to do the skydiving. I think. That's when you tried it because uh, this uh, you can explain yourself. To this. Yeah, no, it was that's how it was. And now, you know, I said that I needed to uh, 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 negotiate negotiate with myself to, to be able to want to do this. Yeah, and that was that was a part of that negotiation. Okay. So like, if I get every weekend off, will I do it? Yeah. Okay, I'll do it. So, I, so I that particular it. negotiation was not optimal training. It was just it was optimal. optimal. Yeah. It was it life. Was it was so aiming for life. It was not aiming for optimal training. Yeah. But then a really interesting thing happened, and I think you one should explain this, not me. But as we, as I get into the first. Is it the threshold block or the first specific season of 2020, yeah. leading up to Worlds in 2021? I, the skydiving season ends in like September, pretty much. It's dead. Um, so I say to you, I'm like, okay, now I don't skydive during the weekends. We can just drop this 5-2 now and just, you know, go a bit more serious because the winter's coming. And you take it from there. <laughs> No, but then I, my suggestion was that uh, we keep it because from what I follow in the in the training logs is that I, I, I believe it was better to have the big load and then to that the second day is like the second day of recovery, uh, like when you group them together like that, I think this could always come back to some kind of a baseline. After two days, no ma almost no matter what load, we throw, except for maybe when we, yeah, when you did the 280 kilometer running race. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I saw that you tore yourself up pretty good there. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, so I, uh, so my, and I think for me, um, I know, uh, yeah, like, like you said, Stephen, all about it. Like m many supporters, and I was for sure one of them that when I skated, like, you want to train and you want to, and you don't feel good when you can't train. Like right. if, if you rest two days, that's can like the second day can be uh, really bad yeah. in your head. And it was, I and it, say, was it was bad like, for him also. It was really like, I had to learn how, how I would react to that. I was yeah. all, like beginning. I felt depressed on Sundays. I was like, Oh, my life is so pointless. Thank God I'm <laughs> training on Monday. So I have something to do with this time. <laughs> but then I started to realize, okay, this is occurring every week. And then it wasn't as bad. Then it was like, oh, I'm not feeling so good today. So, oh, it's a Sunday. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. It's Monday tomorrow. Nice. Here we go. And that was really, you know, I started looking forward to Monday sessions. And this is kind of sick because Monday sessions, that was like four times 30 minutes and 400 watts on the bike. No one looks forward to that shit. But I was <laughs> because, you know, I knew that it saved me from this <laughs> torture of a Sunday, which is the second day of rest. <laughs> and, you know, and, in, and in, in Swedish, in Swedish uh, sports, um, uh, we've also had um, Per Elofsson, you know, the yeah, 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 yeah. was uh, really good. Uh, and, uh, and he's known for that he, he trained in this way, in his, uh, in his build-up, in his earlier years, that he always trained the 5-2. Okay. Uh, I, I know he had, uh, you know, maybe... Uh, Hans Christian Holmberg, who was yeah, 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 Jose, yeah, Jose, yeah, Jose, yeah. he was involved with him, and, and I, 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 uh, I got during my own career, I got some help from Jose uh, with a build up of training and stuff, and I had, had many interesting discussions with Jose about this. So to me, the five two model was uh, yeah, really not, like I thought it could have some really big advantages to use it. Yeah, uh, and I knew he had used it for right. In, uh, in his early career to become really good and i knew and this i don't know for sure but for, I, i've rumors i've heard is that in the end he changed it and he do six one instead and then his career was going yeah right. that can happen for a few reasons but i know he had a really success with uh, the five okay. two uh, well that's interesting you you really have to you have to practice everything like and the same is like resting days it's really hard in the beginning because as an athlete when you're used to never resting 
you don't yeah. you don't really have that social uh, network of being able to spend two days with someone all of a sudden right and that I think that's what's stopping athletes from not training the most because they have no idea what they're supposed to be doing with their time if they're not training and they feel like they're you know being useless and that, yeah. i think that that was really really hard for me to start doing and i don't think i could have done it if it wasn't because of the interest of the skydiving community um huh. and also the weeks when i had something planned for my two rest days then it was really easy then i was never suffering on sundays the right. problem was i didn't have any plan for saturday or especially sunday but i just you know been doing nothing to do this then i thought like oh yeah that, that was tough so it's really a way of you got to take care of yourself in that way also so that you want to do it that way because it's really right. as you want to say really advantages because suddenly you get those you always get the reset like you want to say mm-hmm. you always get the reset and most athletes they they don't have values based from reset but when we when i trained it was like a monday session it was always a monday session and the tuesday session was always a tuesday session which was the second day after two consecutive rest days right so the numbers they meant a lot more to us than they mean to anyone else like we could read them in a way that no one else can read numbers right because we had this very very monotonous system that made it really really easy to see okay the heart rate today on the warm up is 160 what does that mean? Like mm. we, we had so much data on, okay, on, on the fifth day of training, the heart rate could be 20 beats per minute lower than on the first day of training. Now, you know, I, I still dared to go hard because I knew this is not an issue. Because but you've got the two day reset coming. Exactly. And I've done this right. continuously week after week after week. So I never have to, you know, the situation occurred so many times that it wasn't a guessing game. We wasn't like shooting from our hips. I mean, I mean it's a guessing game, but we were at least aiming. Yeah. Um, well, I know. I think that's really fascinating because I've been interested, you know, I, I've done a little bit on recovery on, on parasympathetic function and, and, you know, the autonomic nervous system. And, and, and one of the big issues we see with overreaching and when it goes wrong is this issue of the heart rate actually gets depressed and but athletes misinterpret it as being well that must mean i'm in good shape i'll double down you know i'll 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 push intensity even harder whereas you know you even use the 10 10 beat per minute uh kind of as a as a guide if it's 10 beats depressed that's not a good thing that's a that's a negative response uh but that two days per week was giving you a reset on this autonomic nervous system it seems at least at least you had a good as you say you kind of had a structure that was allowing you to monitor quite well um so i really you know it sounds like it's a bit of serendipity plus a bit of historical precedent that others had done this successfully it comes together um and and ends up working really well for you um the only thing I saw in your data was occasionally it was the, the one legged squats and the ultra running that occasionally tore up your legs so much that you had to take even more than two days off. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Uh, the the one legged squats were not so much a part of that. It was more that when, when my legs didn't work, I had some, you know, overworked knees or whatever you should call it. Uh, yeah. You couldn't run and I couldn't really bike. Then the one leg squat was my uh, substitute. Okay. So it seems like it was the one leg squats that made. Oh. made me have to rest eventually. But that was just more like phase one of having to rest. Yeah. Okay. yeah so the yeah. ultra runs they really served the, the purpose of inspiring me to want to train more. But they also, you know, they crave their victims kind of because you know I always had backlashes after them and I always had small injuries after them and. To me, mostly it was worth it. Uh, I never really got banged too hard the wrong way, I think. Yeah. Um, but then there were also, when I started doing bicarbonate a lot, uh, I also had a backlash. This was the uh, threshold season of uh, 2021 leading up to the 2022 Olympics, uh, where I, you know, I started doing lots of bicarbonates and suddenly I was able to keep my watt numbers even higher throughout the uh, threshold week. Yeah. Uh, 
and that was also thanks to the 5-2, I could take notice of that early. Because during the threshold season, I would uh, estimate how hard the session was. And I would, you know, I would want a certain uh, acceleration of, or increase of uh, how hard I thought that the session was. So the Monday sessions were not supposed to be as hard as a Friday session. On the paper, the, the Monday session was harder than the Friday one. But mentally, it was a lot easier because my body was fresh. And the goal was always to be able to do those five continuous days. So I wouldn't do like a super session and then, you know, do a shit session day four and having to take day five off. Right. Uh, and so I really learned to monitor that. And what happened was when I started doing the bicarbonate, I was able to push it harder and do longer sets and higher watts. And then I took my two rest days off. And after two rest days, I, I had done like five days of training, which of four I had been using bicarbonate or four. Um, and after those two days of rest, I did my Monday session. And the Monday session felt like a Thursday session or Friday session. Right. And then I knew like immediately, like, I think I did like one and a half set. And then I just pulled out, I called you one and I'm like, okay, so this is what I did last week. Now it feels like this. I really think I should abort this and just do two days off and then we reset and we go again. And like, that that decision was based on a what diff of i was around between 400 and 410 watts the week before that monday session i think i did i started off at 405 watts maybe after 30 minutes i had or 20 minutes maybe after 20 minutes i had done an average of 396 watts so it was not a big gap at all yeah. and then i went for the second set and I did 10 minutes of it. And I believe my average was 391 or something. Right. And then I aborted it. So the, yeah. like the abortion there is really, it's a 3% diff. That's all there is. Right. It's more right. that. Just because I had like, I had the system. Of, I know how I feel on a Monday. And yeah. now I did the thing that is a little bit unordinary for me. And I see the different values compared to how I'm feeling. And then it's really easy to pull the plug. Yeah, if you yeah. don't have that system, I mean, you're going for another five days of training and perhaps you're dropping one set on the first day and dropping two sets the next day, taking one rest day off and you're like, what's happening here? It's like, but thanks to yeah. the system. So it's a slippery slope down. Uh, yeah. But, but you know, you mentioned the by car, but I, 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 we don't want to go down that rabbit hole because that'd be another hour we could talk about. Yeah, I've, I've talked with the mountain guys and, and the by carb and, and and I also talked with Tim DeClerc from uh, from uh, Quick Step about bicarb, and basically the same same story was seems to be good, but if you use it continuously, then it can create a it ends up facilitating kind of an overload, and 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 it you end up kind of coming out of balance, and so that same story was no we're not we're going to use it when we need it but we're not going to use it during training on many days in a row because it seems to facilitate kind of an overload situation we, we ended up there more based on we do not dare to do this like we were already the best in the world when we started to do it by <coughs> and we didn't want to take the risk but i think my speculation is that if you're able to use the bicarbonate in, say, for example, an overreach, I think you can do the overreach more successfully. And perhaps you should use the bicarbonate if you use the five two systems. Maybe you should do it Thursday and Friday. Mm. But we, we didn't want to go that road too far because, you know, it was gamble and we didn't need gamble. Right, right. I got you. Well, we'll let that we'll let that sit for a while. But it but it is an interesting aspect that I that I keep hearing and it's popping up all over the radar. The use of bicarbonate, the use of these new formulations that are easier on the stomach and so forth that seem to facilitate keeping the the pH uh, elevated for many hours and everything. But but let's get back. If we if we talk a little bit of measurements during your during your uh, uh, aerobic block, if you did lactate measurements on a bike, it, you know you start at 200 watts, but you're doing 250, 265 watts for hours. That's you know pretty good, pretty solid watts for that duration. What was your uh, what was your lactate? Did you do some? You never checked it. I checked on some of the threshold sessions. 
Uh, yeah, but uh, not the low intensity. No, it didn't. Okay. Like this, uh, we ended up being very serious about numbers and measuring a lot. I think mm. we were measuring more than most people towards the end. But as I started off my first aerobic season in 2019, uh, I didn't have a heart rate meter. For the first 10 months, I was training with this digital watch. I had a stop keeper. That was all I had. Because, I mean, people are trying to rub me the other way, but and you were really forgiving here. <laughs> because, <laughs> yeah, you were <laughs> up until a point. Um, economics was not at the, looking the brightest at the time. So it, it, the, I wasn't really feeling the investment. Uh, but mostly it was, to me, as soon as I hit the start button on a, on a like a training watch, I would go for like, okay, what's my speed? Uh, how, how far have I come? Yeah. And, and that really just made me run the flattest roads. Like uh, roads. Yeah. It was, you know, training became so boring. And, and I right. knew that a year and a half of this, I don't need boring training. I need something that's fun and stimulating. And it doesn't really matter if my heart rate's 130 or 140 or 150. Like it was a lot more important to get the hours and want to do the hours again tomorrow. And I I'm didn't think the, the watch helped me there. I got you. I, I, I totally I, understand I, that. No, that no, yeah. So last, last year after, when you had the watch after last season, we had some problems with that. I yeah. remember some yeah. conversations about <laughs> pace in running and I, I'm trying to <laughs> remember now you have this fancy watch, but you don't have to run or you don't have to be disappointed if you run more than right. run. Just minutes. yeah, you got to learn to just turn it on and then forget about it. It's there, but it's not. It's yeah, okay. I'm with you. So you were just really going on feeling, uh, at least in the in the aerobic season, um, and clearly that was aerobic for you because it's 150 watts below your threshold, uh, which you did verify with blood lactate, and and so when you went into the threshold season, then you're accumulating a lot of minutes at threshold now you know there's there's it's contentious this term threshold because it's kind of a range um it sounds like you were at the upper end maybe or i, I i'm not sure but you 405 408 watts sounds maybe pretty far up the scale of you know if we if your first turn point was maybe 350 40 i don't know what are you guessing do you have any guesses on that lactate stuff? So are you thinking more like um, millimole? Yeah, like if, you know, when we, if you had gone into a laboratory, one of the traditional ways to do lactate testing, they would put you on the bike, you do these five minute periods at, at just, at, you know, increasing watts, 20 watts increase each time or so, 25. And we would probably, initially, you'd be really low in lactate, and then there'd be just a small step up, and that would be that first turn point. And that might for you be at, I don't know, 325 watts or 340 or, you know, for J Tim LeClerc, it's 325, for example. Uh, and, you know, and he's a threshold kind of guy that can go and go and go at threshold like you. Uh, and then maybe your second turn point would be somewhere around 400, above, slightly above. So let's say 325, just to throw out numbers, 325 to 410 maybe represents your kind of from the lower end of your lactate threshold range <laughs> whoops <laughs> there we go uh got to have a little bit of excitement in the interview here uh so let's say let's say it's that range 325 to three to 400 and five ten watts or whatever is that does that sound reasonable or am i off like i was always considering ftp before i considered threshold okay yeah uh, and i think compared to my ftp i was always low uh, and you when you say functional threshold power you mean you're did you use 20 minute power and then take 0.95 of that the actual power that you could do for one hour yeah the actual power oh yeah, you did the you did the real hour of power. Okay. Yeah, but the thing is, we never measured it. We never wasted time doing tests because we had such a monotonous training program that every day was a test. Yeah. 
So we never knew what my FTP actually was, but I think it was around 430 maybe. Okay. Yeah, but we but we knew that during training you could do blocks of yeah, for example, uh, three by thirty minutes. Uh, at, and you also did several times. You did the sixty minutes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, like uh, sixty minutes. Uh, uh, like you could do sixty plus. Yeah, yeah. And what? And if you did a solid sixty, what did you? How many watts were you at? I don't remember as ever doing a session of actually sixty. I remember. In the summer of 2020, I did a session of 90 minutes, and then I had 404. You did 90 f straight? Yeah, 90 straight of 404. All right, I, I just got to say in Texan, damn. You know, <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. That was, that's that that's was, solid. Think. That's solid, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking deep that day. Um, but I did lots of, yeah, I did. I did lots of stuff with like four ten, like four times thirty minutes with five minutes rest of yeah. Uh, all right. So I mean, yeah. So the engine, the aerobic engine, is really solid. Like you said, your you your threshold power is is I would say but world really world really class. Values were at this point because I, I think I was a little under four millimole when I did those four hundred watt sessions. That's yeah. that's my estimate. Like I was doing some testing with the uh, lactate meter. But I think it was too cold outside in Sweden where I bike to to get like to get it to work properly. Right. Um, right. It just the, the numbers just didn't seem right. We tried always to do. Uh, I I I advised Nils that we should do always earlier in the weeks do uh, long uh, long sets because then you know like for sure if you can do thirty minutes and those kind of like four by thirty minutes or something uh, the long sets at 405 watts or something then you then you know that this is not about if you can do if you do four yeah. by 30 minutes on it's not it's not a, <laughs> that's right I, I i'm with you i'm the same way that let the prescription guide it kind of forces you into the right intensity yeah. um and so you were clearly there that was a nice way of chasing it because towards the end of the weeks i would just shorten the time frame of the interval to be able to keep the same wattage yeah yeah so that gotcha. and it, that was the way we hunted it. Like I think there's another way to hunt it, which works. Like I hunted hours above 400. That's what I was doing. I think another way of hunting it would be like hunt. You decide which interval am I gonna do. Let's just settle for 12 minutes. Let's say that's that's the session, six times 12 minutes. Now you don't get as much hours, but then you can hunt the wattage instead. He's trying mm. to go for 410, 420, 430, and just increase that. But that's not what we were looking to do, really. We were looking to expand the time under tension more. And right. to this day, I mean, it was very successful. I'm not sure that was the most successful way of doing it. Perhaps the other way around would also work excellent. Um, yeah, yeah. Nice. And, and that's always going to be a possibility to, but uh, the I'm other sure. thing it's it's worth mentioning that, you know, I went in, when you did these periods, you, you, you said you came up to where you were doing up to eight hours a week at threshold in this 400 watt range. And then you were, you were extending out your total volume by doing, uh, at the end of these sessions, you would get back on the bike and ride at 220 Watts or something like that, uh, for, three hours, two, three hours. And so you were still getting a lot of, a pretty hefty total volume. I think you kept it at 25 hours during those, that threshold period. Um, and then you wrote that you tweaked, you played a little bit with going over eight hours, but then it always on the threshold work, but then it always went wrong. Uh, how, how did you, you just, you started overreaching. Is that what you would feel? Um, <clears throat> like I just, I just couldn't do the. It was just too hard to be able to do something that approximated the 400 watt sessions that I was doing. Mm -hmm. um, like I had some really tough sessions, but some days where you, I just couldn't get it right. Mm -hmm. And I think if I would have really, really wished for being able to do a week of nine hours, I would have been able to by doing easier intervals earlier on in the week. To, instead of starting the week with four times 30, maybe started with, I don't know, uh, 12 times 10, perhaps. Uh, 
Yeah. But then I would think I would have been able to do more hours. But would it be more effective? I, I don't really know. No. It was just, I remember this one week, I did eight hours in four days. And I was just like, okay, this is it. This is the week where I'm going to do it, you know? Uh, and then I just show up to the Friday session, everything's off. So, you know, I'm just throwing in a towel after like first set. Or right, 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 right. It's not, and I, I think that's a, re- <laughs> we're, we're, we're praising the 5 2 a lot, but that's really one of the advantages of the 5 2. A lot of athletes, me included, when I was younger, we do not dare to throw in the towel during a session. But right. I don't know how many times this year I've called you during sessions. Like, this is what, the way I'm feeling. This is the, the numbers of the lap times. Mm. This is my heart rate. This is what I want to do, and which was usually quit. <laughs> what do you think of that? <laughs> Right, <laughs> and then we discuss it, and we, because because we could have so so much numbers to kind of build up the argument. The argument was never, "Am I mentally weak? Am I right. just not mentally fit to do this?" Because when I was younger, I was having that conversation with myself quite a lot, and really, you know, punching myself like, "Right, oh, I'm weak, fuck, I don't get through it," you know. Uh, but that, that was the argumentation. It, it was a lot more. Is this the proper path? And that really built up in a way of being able to speak about stuff that was, uh, yeah, that I never experienced before. But... So it built think... myself. Yeah, and you say something there that I think is extremely important for our young athletes and athletes in general. And I've seen it with my own daughter is that I, I just base myself on the premise that, look, these athletes are extremely motivated you're extremely motivated to perform. So then if your brain is saying, I, I, I can't do this, I'm tired, it doesn't mean you're weak. It means your body needs rest. And, and, and having faith in that, you know, in trusting what your mind is telling you is so important, but I think it's really difficult for a lot of athletes to, to do is, you know, you, you, there's just this culture of, well, no, you just got to tough it out. And, uh, but clearly you, you know, you knew you were doing tough sessions. You knew that it wasn't an issue of men- mental toughness. So then you could trust that if the numbers are off, we're going to back down. We're going to, you know, I, throwing in the towel is okay. Um, and I, you know, you don't see that very often, but, but you had a system that you had faith in. And so, uh, that was really interesting to me to read. And I think uh, the ultras really helped there as well uh because then i got to do the ultra running stuff and the adventure then i really got to experience and confirm for myself okay i know how to fight and sometimes i didn't sometimes i was mentally and 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 that's not out of the picture just because you're an elite athlete and motivated as you say it doesn't make you you know only strong it doesn't work that way right yeah you can have weak days yeah exactly exactly we all have that and I think, yeah, the numbers just help you to navigate through that a little bit easier. And I think you'd be lying to yourself if you say that, no, I'm a pro athlete, I'm motivated enough, that's not the issue. You know, when, when we had the discussions, me and you on, and you one says, Nils, I really think you should keep going today. It's not like I'm happy about that. It's not like I'm sharing on my bike. Like, oh yeah, let's go for another five times eight minutes. <laughs> this is what I want to do in the world. <laughs> like, it's really not like that. Because right? once you say, once you tap the, you know, call and you say like, hey, I really want to quit. Like, I, I'm just hoping that he thinks so too. And when he wasn't, it was like, oh damn, he's probably right. <laughs> Uh, this, but it sounds like you had a good working relationship, you know, and, and, uh, and you trusted each other and I'm, and I'm going back, I'm seeing a quote that was, uh, I gotta tell you, Niels, you know, I like your writing. You, you it's very quotable. And, and, uh, so I think you have a future in, in writing as long as you stay honest, like you are here. I held myself to a high standard and I rewarded myself properly and often. When I failed, I forgave myself and tried my best not to fail again. What was, what was a fail? What, how, explain failed when I failed. What, what kind of thing would happen that you would call a failure in the training process? Yeah, so I'm out biking and uh, I've been biking for five hours and the chain breaks. And the session was six hours. I would say a failure would be not to find a way to complete the last hour. 
Okay. And there's many ways to do that. But it's like, to me, the argument was always, always like, okay, I finished fourth. What was the reason why I finished fourth? What's the reason? Because my shame broke and I wasn't willing to get on the uh, trainer for one hour. Is that why I came fourth? Is that, is that like valid reason for me to become fourth? Like, no, it's not. I, I could have changed that. Like, okay, let's, let's do that. Let's stay honest. Let's try to get that. Do what I can within the framework I wanted to work in to achieve the target. So you put the bike on your shoulder and you run for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was stuff like that. Yeah. Stuff like that. Uh, and, uh, but yeah, then I think really the essence there is the re rewarding part, which I was really bad at, especially growing up saying like, hey, today you were not the fastest peace skater in the world, but you were better than you were yesterday. And that's really something. Hmm. Well, that's for me. That's something that uh, I found really fascinating with Nils, with working with Nils uh, in the last couple of years. This this way of uh, approaching this mental uh, aspect, also during training, especially during training, maybe. And as he says, to be nice, to be nice to yourself. It has a little bit to do with what you said, Stephen, about um, uh, yeah, that most most athletes they are like they are so dedicated motivated they're trying their best and also to like uh, to give yourself that recognition that i am i i'm doing my best here i am doing my best here uh and uh, and to try to find like uh, to be content with that my best is also good enough like this is my best I'm doing my best it's good enough yeah. and, uh, and and uh, i think that you you you, you you frame it as being nice to yourself sometimes during that. Like, like when, when if, if, you're, if you're biking six hours and it's uh, raining and it's shit and it's cold, uh, you have to find something to think about that, uh, that makes it, uh, it, 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 it won't get easier if you also punish yourself with your mind. No. Like, oh, this sucks or this is uh, whatever yeah. it is. Why do I hate my dream so much? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, it really is a fascinating topic and it, and it you know, I, I've said in different settings that all of us, people like me, there were so-called exercise physiologists that we slowly become hobby psychologists along the way because we find out that you cannot cut the head off and just think about the you know the heart rate and the lactate and that it, it, it everything goes together and this this discussion the things you write it it's so it comes out so clearly that you know it you you are negotiating with yourself constantly you have to come to peace with you know find peace with your decisions and 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 find a headspace that is that is healthy in in a process that is potentially not very healthy. I mean, it's pretty damn extreme. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying that on general principles, you know, the, the, the athletes like you that are doing these, these tremendous, uh, you know, pushing the barriers, it's not necessarily the most healthy lifestyle in the world. You know, it's, it's right on the edge of disaster. Uh, <laughs> You know, so so you better be kind to yourself at least some of the time. You better be able to pull the plug on a workout occasionally or take the two days off. You know, so I, I find this to be a really a good cautionary tale or a good lesson in, in balance and finding balance in in an extreme goal set goal environment. You know, and so uh, I can't. I think it's really important to emphasize the psychological aspects of the things you guys did uh it wasn't really? just about 400 watts you know <laughs> one thing that really comes to mind is to say that uh, and about being nice to yourself and you know hugging yourself through those threshold sets is um as, as i was getting into a new season a new type of training specific season was you know it was very high intensity uh in large minutes I'd say, and still yeah. threshold season was also like, it was grueling, you know? Yeah. And 
coming out of the aerobic season. I mean, I've, I've, I've been doing lots of seven, six, seven hour rides on the bike. I mean, it's not, um, it's not a walk in the park. Not, neither season is a walk in the park. And yeah. you know that as you start the next season, like, okay, this is going to be, I'm not sure if I can do this because this is so hard. I still mm -hmm. remember, we still talk about it sometimes. The first ice session I did this year, I was the reigning world champions in the 5K and the 10K. And I had just finished a threshold season of, you know, I don't know how many weeks I did of eight hours, but, but lots, you know? And I know that, and I know that, you know, a part of me is this beast that can do all this training. And I was still nervous as I got on the ice for the first proper ice session. Like, I don't think I talked at all from the warm up start until we actually, you know, got on the ice and started doing work. And, and the session was, it was not a good session at all. However, what I was nervous about was, am I mentally fit to put out the work that's needed today? And the answer was no, I wasn't. And the answer up until very recently has been no, since I started skating when I was eight years old. I, I'm not fit enough to do this to the utmost of my capacity. I have not learned that yet. So if you want to learn that, you have to spend the time within the sport and you have to keep on giving yourself the stimuli, not only physical stimuli, but mental stimuli of mm. trying to thrive within this challenge. And for you to want to take on this challenge as many times as you have to take it on, if you want to be as successful as I want it to be, then you really, really gotta want this. And if you hate yourself doing it and you treat yourself like shit while you do it, you're not gonna put yourself out there enough times to learn what you need to learn. So really the key to mental toughness is by wanting to do the physical challenge over and over and over. And suddenly it's a routine. Suddenly you just go out there and all that excitement is, is it's gone. And you know, you're standing on the starting line of a competition day. And for the first time since you woke up that morning, you're feeling safe and secure because now you know what to do. Like this is what you train for. And so it's really being kind to yourself. It's not because you're great. It's because you can be great if you want to. I'm, I'm, I'm silent as I think through these things, <laughs> but, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, I mean, but it, but it is, uh, when I listen to you and when I think of other athletes I've met, it is this, uh, this yin and yang between toughness and acceptance, you know, cause they sound like kind of the opposites. Toughness means I don't accept failure. I just plow through but but except if you don't have acceptance if you don't have acceptance of the the that it won't be perfect every day that you'll have good and bad days and so forth that that you i don't know it you you start fighting yourself maybe or you 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 dread the the the, the dread overtakes the the mission uh, you know i it's it's hard to you know i i think i understand what you're saying and i think the people who listen will have a will be able to to connect to it but it's it's a difficult construct you know because it's 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 part part tough and part soft or part accepting at the same time is that is that right yeah i think that's how you put it i think that's really it. i think that's really how i would put it as well it's really it's really in my head it's really soft when i do it yeah i'm really like i i remember the threshold season i met you one right before i was heading out on my bike right and you one met me in the hallway and he's like come on fight today and i and I was looking at him like fight right. i don't i don't fight right you know i'm i'm taking care of myself out there you know i'm trying to be nice to my little kid inside and you know tell him to be strong and stuff i don't fight right like i don't have the energy to fight for two hours yeah it's interesting that's a really <laughs> You know, Iliad Kipchoge, the great marathoner, you know, he, he seems to almost try to smile when it's hurting the most, you know, and, and, <laughs> and, 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 and Tim, the cleric, he was talking about the same thing as trying to find joy, find, give yourself some happiness in 
a sporting life that occasionally there are shitty days, you know, or like you said, when it's cold and rainy and you're out for six hours and every part of you is freezing, you know, where is the joy? And so that, <laughs> that, but there needs to be some joy, some, some happiness in this really tough process that you're, you're endeavoring, you know? And so I find that, you know, there's a common thread I find when I talk to athletes like you and, and, or when I read what they discuss around this process is, is, you know, finding, finding a bit of joy in the suck as the Marines say, embrace, you know, the Marines, I think they say embrace the suck or whatever, which you're, you know, you're talking a lot about that, about embracing the, yeah, the, the training process is not fun and games. Uh, but you, you you do find things to smile about. Is that fair? Yeah, yeah, that's fair enough. And I think you also have to create the stuff you can smile about. There you go. You to get to seven hours. I mean, yeah. there's at least two restaurants you gotta visit to get to seven hours. If you don't understand <laughs> that, you never do it. Right. The magic of the cappuccino. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And like, yeah. if you want energy for six, six to seven hours, you you gotta you know go beyond the cappuccino as well. <laughs> yeah <laughs> candy i don't know what all was involved but uh uh i i hear you and and so then we're you know you get on the ice and you're doing these these um you know for for non-skaters they won't necessarily appreciate all of the 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 lap times and everything but 30 second laps that brings you to 12 30 which is you know kind of a magic barrier in in a, in a sport that's had a lot of different barriers along the way um that's the current one 5000 meter you knock another second off the lap times and you're down at that 6 minute pace uh and so then you decide all right whoever does the most 30 second laps in the weeks leading up to a race they're going to win is kind of the basic philosophy and you start just pounding the laps and this is uh, I can say that when when I was working with Bob De Jong, we made we did single workouts of with twenty five of these laps, you know, for and 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 he would do thirty one second laps, and we were darn happy with that. Uh, so so you blew the blew the hell out of the whole calibration with saying we're gonna I'm gonna do two hundred and forty laps at thirty, you know, ish a week uh it's just you know i i'm sure the speed skating world is like how, how, no way that can't be right how do you do that uh so talk about how you know <laughs> what was it like what if you were gonna all right let's let me let me put this in a terms that other people can relate to a little bit if you were going to try to convert 30 second laps and in, in doing you're doing it in eight minute blocks on the 10k sessions for four minute no eight laps four. so it's four minutes. eight laps sorry yeah four minute blocks eight lap blocks um if you were going to translate that to watts on a bike i know it's impossible but if you were going to try to estimate what would that be like uh, you know those sets i don't know i would assume that it's like world elite biking as fast as they can for 12 and a half minutes yeah, so they're at Is between like 500 and 600, 550, 600. I mean, they're doing, yeah, I don't know, 550, maybe five. Yeah, it sounds, I, I, yeah, yeah, sounds, it sounds about, yeah. 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 So that should help people understand. It's it's a huge power output because if you're hitting 50 kilometers, 53 kilometers, two kilometers an hour on the ice, you know, you've got the wind resistance is so high. It's It's big powers uh that you're pushing um i guess you're at about 50 kilometers an hour on the yeah. ice yeah and, and and 50 kilometers an hour on a bike people can appreciate that they got to push some serious watts uh to do that so you know i just want people to understand what these sessions are like they are you know you're on the ragged edge here um and and at the same time you've got to maintain technique on a 1.2 millimeter the savior though because when you do biking i mean you have music to distract yourself and perhaps there's 
tree next to the road or something. But when you skate, you really have to stay focused on, okay, I'm going to put this blade down and I'm going to do it properly, but I'm also going to do it in a swing so it gets a pendulum motion so I get the speed from it. And yeah. like, and while balancing and keeping your, you know, it's so much focus on the technical performance that you cannot bother with being tired at really. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I really kept my mind occupied wh while I was skating. Right. And, and I think that was a great relief for me. And in the same way as you can keep your mind occupied when you're in a tight race, of course, then there's the adrenaline factor. But when, when you ha have a tight race and you try to do it properly and be, you know, tactical about it, you, you're not constantly considering how much pain am I feeling in my legs right now. You're, you're somewhere else. And that right. was the technical lesson of it. And, and yeah. Somewhere else. And you use the, you're kind of in a state of flow technically and move, you know, just the movement is giving you a feedback of, of, and, and I, and I have to say that, you know, I was a rower and rowing, speed skating, cross country skiing, they share this, this, this rhythm of, of push and glide, you know, that is different than cycling. It's different than running that does seem to give you back some, you know, feedback of, of, as it's happening is am i in the groove is it you know you get a positive feedback if you're in if it's going well if it's going shitty it gives you a negative feedback but but technically you know i can see how what you're talking about is that if you if you're in the groove and you're hitting the times and and you're hit, the swings feel right that that gives you kind of a reinforcement would that be was that is that how you felt for sure yeah, because I, I didn't I didn't feel that very much in rowing, but a few times I did, and it's quite <laughs> <laughs> so so. But but there's just there is a rhythm to skating and a rhythm to these sports that's different. Uh, I find you know that really you know you, you get a lot of positive ex feedback from it when it is going well. Uh, maybe again. It, the feedback is is not so great at times when it's not going well but but it sounds like technically tech the technique was something was that was fairly okay for you and you didn't have to use it, it you didn't fight a lot on your technique is that right i mean you you were fairly stable technically or I'm not sure i was actually no no you don't. Uh, i I th uh, I think it, this is really uh, he's really talented technically. Like he, yeah. re he has a really good feeling for it, yeah. and he's super like as he expressed now that he is uh, like uh, internally focused while skating, and he can maintain that focus on his like on the timing and a little bit like you said that on this feeling of the the push and the glide and everything, and he's he's always really. Even though these, like, if you talk about these intervals, and uh, yeah, they, they are super hard, like six times, uh, six times four minutes, uh, five times a week. But he can uh, still do it and maintain a, a, a like internal focus on the, on the movement and on on timing and stuff. So, and I think that's, uh, uh, I I think that's not that. Not something that all speed skater has. Or that right. They don't have. Yeah. So I think. You, you, and you, uh, one thing I, I thought about uh, earlier when you said about that this must have rocked the speed skating world or with the numbers and uh, with his uh, 240 laps every week. And this yeah. was, of course, for this season, it was, yeah, we already sh showed a lot how we worked last year. So yeah, this yeah. year, yeah, it was not so much. But last year, it was really big when we were in. Right. He well, for the world uh, for the world championships for example and when you put down these weeks with uh, 240 laps of the uh, 30s and of course and you are like everyone is training on the same rink there was a bubble at that time yeah. and everyone is watching like uh, and people are just standing and watching him train and it's like like I, I can imagine it's like something that's you know when I started skating you heard stories about Eric Hayden when he was skating and he's yeah. still training 100 laps and then he drank coffee and then he did 100 more or some stories and i i 
I said that last year. I think what, what happened these weeks here in Hirnfeld, that's what people would tell stories about in the future. Because this was, I think, like you said, Bob de Jong, which was a great skater. He, yeah. Yeah. He dominated, uh, he was not alone dominating, but he was one of the dominating skaters, 5 and 10K for many, many yeah. years. Yeah. He was so good. And maybe he did, maybe he, he could do in a week, if he did a, a, one of those tempo sessions where he did 25 laps, uh, and of course, lots of other training, but that was a week with the, this was, this was good tempo training. Oh yeah. And he, he was, we, we, we were super happy with, yeah. if he did that session, and, you know, and then when everyone is on a track and there's one guy and he's doing 250 or 240 laps <laughs> one this week yeah. and every, and like when, it, when people see it, when his opponents like the, or the friends that also skate the long distance from other countries when they see it when you see it you know you know you know that this you know you know what he you, you know what your opponent can do when you see it in training then you and, yeah. and, and also in speeding in speed skating what we have done different really different to all other speed skaters on the scene at this moment is that we skate everything in or out there everything in or yeah. after yeah and i mean yeah. and, and, it's, and it's not like it's not almost everything it's everything it's not one lap in there's maybe you did uh, maybe you did uh, 10 laps or something in install in october one session or something. Yeah. <laughs> no maybe not no we didn't, no, we didn't do anything no. so it's yeah and, and it's basically you always almost everyone skates on inner corners may some train a little bit on the outer sometimes when you do a tempo you would do inner outer not so often may, some people would do it sometimes maybe bob did it right. i don't know right no i think and 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 oh believe me i've been there and 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 you know when the when all the skaters are on the ice you, you've got this current going the wind is starting to move around the around the rink and and so you've almost got a, a you know yeah, you've you got a, 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 some help and so it tends to give you a false sense of of speed and yeah. and basically what i read from what you were saying is you never allowed yourself that that every lap was honest as honest as could be in terms of its translatability to racing conditions for sure we uh, looked at situations where we could have the best opportunities to train uh, and uh, got to not that we looked for training possibilities where we could train alone, like being the only ones on the ice, because that's uh, it's not always nice. But we never, we did, Nils did so much training when he was like there was like five people on the ice, so there's right. no win. Yeah. Sometimes it's sometimes so you have to do it when there is fifty people on the ice, and then yeah. you get. But but it gives you a lot of uh, honesty about what what your capacity is, and I think that that has. We haven't talked about it so much, but one one thing that we is that we um, we try to narrow down the, the capacities that we wanted to improve, but also the yeah. training session, really, like to become good at this session. Right. So find a session and try to find out if we get better at this session. And I know you talked about it also in podcasts I've heard about this uh, to become good at the session, the four by eight minutes or something. That I've heard you talking about, but if you we find this these sessions, when you get good at it, will it translate to a good result on the race right. on the tank? Right. When you know if if you know those if you know you have it one session, it makes you better on the race, and then, like we did, try to do that at, as often as possible and get better at it and get better at it, and it will translate to the race. And trying right. to find those two things instead of doing, yeah, let's say you. You have 10 different interval sessions that you do and you mix them up and you do it uh, during a four week period in different days and stuff. It's so difficult also to know when am I tired? Like, is this a good, is, was this I a good you. session? Yeah. Because conditions are always differing a little bit also anyway. So if you also differ the, the, the sessions, you, you do with five different interval sessions and it's different conditions on the ice, the different days and the different amount of people and it's so many so it's really hard to say actually after a session if you want to if you're trying to grade it what was this a 10 was it a 9 was it an 8 was it was this good was mm. it bad 
But when you do the same session almost all the time, you it's much easier to know where where yeah. you are on the scale. That yeah. thing very that developed a lot for us even further after the uh, 241 season after the worlds because then we've been doing all the ice stuff and the ice stuff was very purified in that way yeah and as i go into the pre-season of uh, leading up to 2022 we adopted that a lot we removed all the one leg squats they're out of the program all the uh, i did some strength training in the summer of 2020 <clears throat> leading up to 21 yeah, yeah. we dropped all of that and it was it was only aerobic work. It was in different forms. It was some skiing, some running, and some cycling. But it was, yeah, it was truly purified. So I think that idea we really developed it, and yeah. um, took it one step further for this season. And also, I should add that to to know your session, not only to know it as if was it good or was it bad, but also to know it. As I said, when I got into a new season, I was always nervous, and I was always always a little bit conscious about. Am I fit for this? Can I do this? Am I mentally strong? Whatever. As you do the same session five times a week, and it does sound boring, I get that, but as you do it five times a week, you don't have to think about it. People talk about this mental aspect of speed skating. To me, there was no mental aspect. It was a routine. I went on my bike for 16 and a half minutes. I ran to my skates. I tied them. I started skating. I was very tired. I finished the race, and that was it. It didn't really matter if I was having a good day or, or a bad day mentally, if I was happy, if I was sad, if I slept good, if I slept bad. Like all those training sessions, doing the same session over and over and over, week after week, it just taught me that my mental fitness of the day does not seem to correlate with the output of the training. It seems to be other factors. Right. You trust, you just said, I trust my training. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Uh, you, you you trust your training. You get on the starting line, and it's it, it doesn't matter whether you slept three hours or eight hours of that night before. You it's what you've done the last months, uh, and you trust your training. It, that's what I hear from you, um, and uh, and I think that's also a lesson because it it is you know you know in in that world it's so easy to get caught up in every little detail. Did I sleep enough? Did I eat the wrong thing? Did I do this? And 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 the one woman, the person I've coached my own daughter, I've always just tried to say, don't worry about that stuff. You know, you're going to be fine because your training has been fine, you know, and, and it's trying to, to just simplify your mind and say, it, it just doesn't really matter. What matters is uh, that I've done 240, 30 second laps for, you know, for, you know, weeks on end, I think I can do 25 of them now, you know, in a row. I remember uh, when I was, uh, yeah, when I did my junior years, and also when I did the years leading up to 2018, that perhaps we had a hard session on Monday, a hard session on Wednesday, and then maybe some semi-hard stuff on Friday. Let's say it was something like that. And after the Monday session, especially if the Wednesday session was supposed to be harder, I mean, I was just anxious. Tuesday sessions, it was like it's easy distance. I was just thinking about tomorrow. Like, tomorrow's going to be tough, man. But like, last hour of that Tuesday bike ride, I'm like, it sucks now, but it's going to suck even more tomorrow, man. <laughs> and that was just, you know, going on like week after week. But as I do, started doing all this, like same type of session and doing it every day, like Monday evening, I'm like, I can't be bothered with Tuesday. I, I mean, it sucked already. Like, I'm not going to, I don't care about that stuff. It's going to come. I, I got it through today. I'll right. get it through tomorrow. No right. worry. I, got I was, you. I was never anxious about a session, like almost never anxious about a session those past two years. Because, like, it was so routinely based. It was all, almost only when we switched seasons that I was nervous about it. But then I learned, and I trusted myself as I learned, and that was just very, very calm and mental. And that, and that saves was, you a lot of mental energy. Yeah, exactly. So, like, in the media, they, they, call, they call me one of the more, like, mentally stronger skaters at, the, at this point. But I, I really wasn't, that, that was very not genetically. It was more based on the, the training program made me mentally fit. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting. Well, guys, I've been, we've kept you a while here and, and it's been a wonderful conversation. I'm sure we could keep talking about a lot of things. Um, I, I really appreciate both of your time. Is there, you know, my goal, and I think your goal with this, uh, Niels, was to just share and let people hopefully 
extract things that can be useful for them. And so in these last minutes, are there, if you were going to try to help a, a junior athlete or a, a young female athlete or who, or, or an age group, or are there some, some take home messages that you think apply independent of sport that maybe you can share? Oh yeah. Um, it's like answering the question of what's your favorite candy. <laughs> <laughs> Meaning there's so many possibilities or yeah. um you want to start you want I think you have some um, no, but I think um I don't know who who uh, will um, have the most benefit from this advice, but I think that uh, oh and it's so different for different people, but i I think the take home point for me from the process is that the, the most important that, that applies to the most sporters, I think, is build that base. Build the base. The base, as we've all known for so long, it, it, it helps with everything else. And, uh, and it has no, not, it's not really necessary to be, in my opinion, super specific while doing it um i think that and it's so important for young athletes i think also to develop like uh yeah dif different skill sets from other sports and stuff i think it can mm -hmm. it can give you so many more opportunities uh, as uh, uh yeah to to solve technical problems or coordination problems. So when you know no different, if we're, uh, yeah, let's talk about endurance sports. Mm, right. Endurance people here. Um, and, uh, and I, and the second is what we just talked about to, to try to find that, find that session with, if, if you talk about high performance in the end, to talk about race results, find those that session, find that session that that you know when I get better at this, I will become better at the race. If you can find that, when you find that session, and to and to do that a lot, that's 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 I think two of the biggest take home points from like physiologically, like right. training process wise. You have to confront reality, you confront your limitations in these sessions and not try to steer around them. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think I hear it so much in speed skating also from uh, yeah, different level skaters and experience it myself. If you come to a season and you start racing and you really don't know what to expect. Of course, Niels didn't know, know exactly what to expect, but you have to, you have to train something that is close to the racing in the end helps you a lot with your pacing it helps you with so much to do good races like but so many people come to the races and then and it's like this was the training we did and now and now the race starts and i've done so much training but i still don't know what should my pace be for this race right right you haven't then you haven't trained then you like maybe that's the way to find those trainings Find yeah. a training that can help you pace a race because if you find that training session and you improve that, then you get. I mean, uh, you understand what I mean? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. But if you want to bike well, a one hour, if you want to do a one hour bike uh, world record, then you should find a training session that could that helps you find the pace for that one hour record, and then you get better at that session. That <laughs> then you get better at that pacing session because right. that will make you better. At that. And you're probably going to need to do sessions that encroach on an hour or more in duration. You can't do it with just 10 minute intervals, you know? So I think that's a, I, I see that a lot as athletes or younger age groupers and that try to get around the harsh reality of that. It's going to end up being a one hour time trial, for example. That's, you know? we approach that in a really good manner. I think we, we divided that into three and we try to cut the rest as much as possible. Yeah. And so we got the hour and we got the hour at the what or yeah. whatever we had that times. 
and we were able to do it at the power output level that was required of us from the race. But we were able to do it every day on training because we added just as much rest as needed to be able to do it every day on training. Gotcha. That was our, yeah. that was our session. Yeah. Uh, well, again, I, I'm going to let, I'm going to try to bring this to a close, but I, it's been wonderful. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I'm not saying, I don't think everybody should try to copy what you did. And I don't think you believe that either. But I do believe that it's opened eyes. It, it, I always like to say that by observing athletes, we develop testable hypotheses. You know, the science, we, we don't usually lead the process. The athletes lead the process. And I think that has happened here. You've, you've gone forward with Johan and you've worked through some things and you've, piece, you've taken things from, from predecessors. Nobody ever does anything in total isolation. And you've given us sports scientists some testable hypotheses like the five, two, you know, and say, Hmm, let's see what, is this something that could work for more than just meals? You know? <laughs> so, so this, this, we have to thank you for, uh, and, and, and just wish you the best of luck in whatever is going to be the next thing, you know? The next adventure i don't know what it'll be and i'm sure you're not going to tell us if you do but <laughs> <laughs> i would i would i just don't know yeah so enjoy that enjoy finding whatever comes next Niels, because i know you'll do i know you'll do it well uh so anyway thank you so much and what i'll do is i'll put this out uh on youtube and and people can listen and and dissect it and comment and and so forth so we'll see what happens cool thanks Tim. you bet it was nice have a nice thanks. evening you too you too bye bye bye